Thank you. No problem. So um, we've got the levy paying employers um, who, are, who are those um, big boys um, with uh, over a three million pay bill. And then we've got non levy paying employers, which is everybody else. Um, and the most that those non-levy paying employers will contribute to apprenticeship training um, is 5%. So government will fund 95% of apprenticeship training. And we'll talk more about kind of what that means as we go through. But those levy and government funds then have fairly strict criteria about what they can be used for within the funding rules for apprenticeships. So those funds can be used for apprenticeship training and assessment against an approved apprentice framework or standard. So that's the programme, if you like, the, the kind of outline qualification. They can be used um, for an approved endpoint uh, with an approved training provider and with an, uh, um, an approved endpoint assessment organisation. So we now have registers for both of those, um, which have been through an amount of checks and rigour um, and due diligence, um, which means that employers should be able to be confident um, that they are using kind of trusted organisations. And those funds can be used up to the funding band maximum for that apprenticeship. So every apprenticeship that is approved, um, and I've got a little bit more detail on that, but every apprenticeship that's approved is given a funding band maximum, and they range from... Um, uh, £1,500 for the lowest um, paid for apprenticeship to 27000 So that would be probably a, uh, is likely to be a much more complex technical apprenticeship, perhaps over two, three, four years. Um, and, and in lots of the cases contains a degree. Um, so, so that's the, the band. So the, so the biggest apprenticeship um, that you would pay for is 27,000. And as I said, the maximum that an employer will contribute to that if they're not a levy payer is 5%. So 5% of the highest apprenticeship at 27,000 is about 1,350, well, it's not about, it is 1,350 pounds. Um, but in most cases, the 5% contribution for that training assessment kind of testing, if you like, um, mostly we would see the employer contribution somewhere between 200 and 500 pounds for most standards. So funds can't be used for um, wages. So this was part of where some of your questions were earlier. Um, so they can't use the levy or those government funds for wages, for travel and subsistence costs, for managerial and admin, for traineeships, which is not an apprenticeship, and for the cost of setting up an apprenticeship. So it can't be used for that at the moment, but we will come back to the new incentives, um, which might be able to support some of that. Okay, so the other part of um, that, that kind of movement, I guess, around um, uh, through the reforms, um, is, is around an opportunity now for those levy paying employers, if they cannot, so levy, um, levy um, funds into the digital account, if an employer doesn't use them, and there's absolutely an expectation by government that not everyone will use them, um, because in some cases their levy pot is so big that they couldn't possibly, they don't, they don't want to train and recruit that many people. Um, and for others, it just won't be the right thing to do for other businesses. So there was always a sense that money paid into the levy pot would also top up what government was investing to help to um, contribute to that 95% that government invest in non-levy paying employers. So if you like kind of securing funds for more apprenticeships through levy and then spreading them around, around the business system, if you like. Um, one of the things that um, those levy paying employers can do is um, at the moment their levy funds, if they don't use them, um, are removed from their digital account 24 months after they've been paid into them if, if they're not used. And one of the things that employers can do is to 
decide to transfer some of their levy funds. So anything that they are not going to use, they could decide to direct that themselves somewhere else to another employer, for example, or another group of employers. So, I mean, that's a great opportunity, which we're starting to see large employers really use in the past kind of 12 months or so um, and direct. So for some employers, um, they are uh, they are looking at um, a little bit of um, uh, they might be looking at supporting their supply chain with that. They might be looking at kind of elements that sit nicely within their corporate social responsibility. So we're seeing kind of large employers in localities um, directing um, levy transfer to um, to target kind of young people or perhaps disadvantaged um, learners that employers want to take on those kind of things. Um, so, you know, we're starting to see more movement in that. And I know certainly under Essex County Council, I'm not sure about the other, other bit of the patch um, because I'm less familiar with that. But certainly in Essex County Council, um, they are looking at a programme at the moment where they want to do some central coordination of those funds from local employers so that they can help to redirect them. Um, and that money would then pay that 5% contribution. So that would mean that for those employers who received levy transfer, um, that they, they wouldn't have a cost towards the, the training and assessment side of things. So, so what progress is being made since the reforms? So I think I touched on a little bit of this, but um, apprenticeships generally are longer programmes now. So an apprenticeship must by law be more than 12 months long. Um, no apprenticeship is designed to be shorter than that. And um, where there are employers pulling together um, a, apprenticeship standards that that don't seem to have enough content to really be called an apprenticeship it isn't designed as an apprenticeship it said this isn't an apprenticeship an apprenticeship is a job with significant training so significant kind of skills and development and um you know technical knowledge um in order to do this job um you know that that's being held kind of really really core and central i guess to the reforms so they are longer um they are higher quality and within that quality um we're, we're seeing one of the the um uh, i guess payoffs to quality being an increased amount of off the job training so there is much more rigor now apprenticeships should have always had off the job training um, but actually it's an auditable requirement now so um, training providers and apprentices have to log their off the job training and the guidance around that is it for all apprenticeships it should be a minimum of 20 percent off the job training now that doesn't necessarily mean day release at college um, it might mean away from your phone calls and your normal day-to-day -day work um, and actually doing some research doing some study working on a project connected with the business which is about your kind of learning and about developing kind of competence towards the requirements of your apprenticeship so the majority of off the job training still happens in the workplace but I guess I would describe it as protected study time. It's protected learning time um, that, that, you know, and, and that is certainly helping the quality of the experience as well as the quality of, of kind of learning and progress. Um, with apprenticeship standards, one of the things, and you can only do an apprenticeship standard now from the 1st of August. So all apprenticeship frameworks, which was the old type of apprenticeship, you'll be able to finish them off, but you won't be able to start a new framework. So apprenticeship standards, which is what I've been describing so far, all have a rigorous assessment at the end. So remember I talked about that endpoint assessment organization. So apprenticeships now are a little bit more more like um like perhaps learning to drive um in that you will work with um you will work with a coach and an expert to do off the job learning if you like so you will do some practical learning in terms of driving lessons you will do some theoretical learning 
and then you will be tested independently to test your competence. So you will have a multiple choice test to test your knowledge and you will have a practical assessment to test your, your actual um, kind of competence in, in driving. And apprenticeships are much more like that. So the endpoint assessment is independent. They haven't been involved in your training. They are not linked to your employer. Um, and they are things around, you know, they might be around um, tests, a lot of them are, are include um, a professional discussion with an independent ass assessor, it might be around showcasing some work. There's often two or three assessment methods that are built into that. And some of them look back around the kind of work they've done, but all of them are testing, is somebody competent and a safe pair of hands in terms of um, doing this job? So that certainly is helping with the quality. And we're seeing employers particularly, but absolutely apprentices saying much more positive things about their apprenticeship. I really felt like I achieved this. I really felt like I earned, I feel like I've really succeeded in terms of, of that, um, which, which, is, which is really positive. Okay, um, and the other bit there is around um, all ages. So one of the decisions around reforms was, if employers were going to be funding it, not only should they, um, they be able to decide what the standards look like, what the jobs for apprenticeship should be, but actually they should be open to all ages. So what we've seen with levy introduction and the availability of apprenticeship funding is that we've seen um, employers open up apprenticeships much more to um, all of their workforce. So this is not just about new recruits and young people um, anymore. It's absolutely about all age. And we're seeing people who are, I don't know, doing a different job, taking a career change, doing apprenticeships. Um, and I've, I've got some stats on that for you in a second. So... Um, we've currently got 568 approved apprenticeship standards. So those are, um, those are apprenticeships that are designed to demonstrate competence and to train in a particular job. Um, and some of, them are, um, some of them are very specific jobs like butchery. Um, and some or munitions was one that's been been approved in the last um, in the last month, um, and some of them are a little bit more um, uh, probably kind of generic. So they might be things like team leader, supervisor, or operations departmental manager. Um, those kind of management type apprenticeships, a bit like a business administration apprenticeship, have been really popular because they, they cut across all sectors. You know, there aren't really very many employers that don't have somebody doing some kind of line management or leadership type role um, or needing some kind of, you know, um, administrative role within the business. So I would say general. I'm yet to find an employer um, where there wasn't anything in the apprenticeship mix that, that didn't really work. Um, and where there are enough employers, you know, there might be some niche areas where they say there are only ever going to be 10 people that need to do this job in the country. That wouldn't be appropriate to develop an apprenticeship standard in. Um, but, but where actually there is a case to be made, that's the process that happens with the Institute in, in terms of getting that to happen. So, um, over 500 at the moment improved um, and with a funding band and 95 more in development. So it's an ongoing um, kind of process in terms of approving those. Um, and I've put the link there to where you can see, you can see all of those standards. Um, it, it's actually a really simple, um, nice um, kind of web portal where you can search by a word, you can search by set you can search by the level of apprenticeship um, you know you can search by recently approved apprenticeships so well worth a look you can happily lose 20 minutes of your life just saying I didn't even know that was a job so um, I definitely recommend that to you with a cup of tea at some point 
Okay, and then just a few kind of recent stats, um, I guess, kind of since reforms, and some of these are from a report, I've put the reference on the, you can't really read it, it's tiny, um, but I've put a reference at the bottom of the slide there. Um, uh, around some of the, the this, these are from a review since reforms have, have um, come in. So just a few stats there around um, future prospects of apprentices. So 93% of apprentices who completed in 2017 were in work still 15 to 25 months after completion. And we're seeing some really good data start to come about um, kind of um, potential earnings about how apprenticeships stack up very favorably um, compared to um, a full-time college course or indeed even um, uh, going and doing a degree so we are seeing a real what we need to do is be able to describe that kind of parity of esteem um, to both apprentices employers and parents so that actually you know apprenticeships are seen at the level and and in the in the guise they are now as opposed to kind of what you still often hear and I often hear it too um, when you talk to people around on apprenticeships just for trades on apprenticeships just for not very bright people on apprenticeships just low level and the answer to all of those things is absolutely not um 86 percent of employers um said apprenticeships help develop skills relevant to their organization and 85 percent are satisfied with the apprenticeship so again really positive stat and that's been improving um, through reforms and again that piece around growing advocacy that's always the test for me would employers recommend apprenticeships to others um, and a growing stat there around 43 percent of employers would recommend without even being asked um, about them so again that's probably where our ambassador network kind of come into their own a little bit as well Okay, a bit of further progress. So we talked a bit about the apprenticeship service. So that online service, a bit like an online apprenticeship bank account, um, which allows employers to kind of choose which providers they're going to um, work with and pay for that apprenticeship training. So it is the, the system, if you like, the digital account that kind of makes the funding flow so that there is there is still paperwork, absolutely. I think there always will be um, with, um, with kind of government um, schemes, if you like. Um, but I would say it's less. And I think the digital account will continue to kind of streamline some of that and make it, make it easy, make visibility easier as well. So um, levy payers are able to register on the apprenticeship service and actually so can non-levy um, payers do that now as well. Um, and those are the things that they, they do. They um, receive the funds, manage apprenticeships, um, and pay their training provider through that system. Um, and we've seen quite a shift. So post reforms, um, or since reforms came in, um, we've seen a, a growing shift to the the demography, I guess, of apprenticeships um, since that introduction of the levy. And I think that will continue to shift. Obviously, what we've seen um, initially is a lot more growth around large employers around apprenticeship, because quite frankly, if you've got a levy to spend um, and you've got a million pounds sitting in your levy account, it completely makes sense to have a look and see, is there a way within your business that you can maximise that? So we're starting to see kind of that, that drive through the stats of kind of the, the way that our larger employers have engaged um, with the system. Um, but we have seen um, a shift to that. So I've got a little bit of that for you here. So this is the latest data. Um, and in your data is always, um, uh, it can always move you know it, it should only go up rather than down um, but obviously what we do know kind of at the current time is you know the data that we see at the end of the next quarter will have an impact of, of COVID uh, kind of layered on it um, without a doubt so um, so this will just give you the picture so far so apprenticeship starts in England and again this is an English you can only use the levy and deliver apprenticeships in the way that I'm describing with your English workforce. So whilst it's a UK levy, 
um, it's you can only fund English apprenticeships with it because Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland have their own apprenticeship systems, which is a criticism from employers. Um, but it is the way it is at the moment because education is a devolved policy. Um, so you can see there just under 272,000 apprenticeships reported um, in those first kind of um, first three quarters um, of the academic year. And just to give you some context for that, um, last academic year, so based on a full academic year of data, um, so 2018-19, we had 393,000 starts um, across the country. Um, and I checked yesterday for you, because I knew somebody would ask me the question, 56,000 of those were in the southeast. So about 14% of the national apprenticeship starts last year were in the southeast, which is pretty strong performance. Um, you know, and that had seen about a 7% 7, 7 growth based on the year before. So the highest growing area was London, and I suspect will be London and Greater London um, this year as well um, but actually the southeast does does um, perform strongly around this in terms of starts and growth so this might be where some of the perhaps surprises come in and this is where i want to do a bit of the myth dispelling so the proportion starts by level so we are seeing and i've written on there that, you know we use a lot of language around apprenticeship which is i think where the confusion comes in so we call them intermediate, advanced and higher. We call them level two, level three and other levels. Um, what I've put in, in the slide there is the, the kind of the traditional education equivalent, because I think most people can kind of relate or, or understand that information. Um, so our level two, our, our lowest level apprenticeships, if you like, or our entry level type apprenticeships, um, 32%, just under 32% of those um, were on those levels. But that means that everything else was at kind of what's, what's kind of described as a technical level job and above. You know, so almost 44% at, at level three, an A-level equivalent um, kind of level. And, and huge growth as those higher levels and degree level apprenticeships have been designed through. And don't forget, most of this design has only been, uh, of the new standards has only really been happening since 2016, 2017. So actually to get through the design phase, through approval phase and funding phase, and actually out there being delivered, um, that's a massive amount of growth to almost a quarter of apprenticeships are at a higher level. So level four foundation degree and above. And then age group is the other interesting thing um, to, to look at, um, because I think there's still an, a, a kind of view that most apprentices are young people, school leavers, um, that kind of age group. So here for um, this most recent data um, is, uh, is the stat. So around a quarter of apprentices by start uh, 16 to 18, um, just under a third, uh, 19 to 24. But look at that, 25 and over, almost 45% of people doing an apprenticeship in the first nine months of this year are 25 and over. So you can see how, you know, my read of that is particularly around how employers are using um, levy and non-levy um, employers are using the apprenticeship program for their existing staff. So this is about reskilling, upskilling, kind of progression, thinking about kind of actually what's happening um, within the business. Um, you know, so some, so I, I think interesting stats. You'll tell me if you agree um, when we chat about it in a bit. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for a second and just ask you another question, um, just because you've heard enough of my voice for a couple of minutes. Um, perhaps just a couple of comments, if you've got them, around whether or not your employer contacts are currently showing an interest in, in apprenticeships. And we picked up a couple of the kind of interests or concerns earlier. Is, is there anything else that we haven't already heard? Um, 
around what's going on in your in your day to day job. I think the issue with apprenticeships is um, the bad press that it's had or previous bad experiences prevent employers understanding that it's completely changed. Um, I think that's the biggest issue I get um, is really around, you know, I suppose the, the lack of interest sometimes shown by some of the apprenticeships. Um, you know, how prepared are they being um, how prepared are they for when they go into that job environment and what to expect? I know there's a lot more work going on on that, but yeah. I think it's a lot a lot of it's based on bad experiences in the past that yeah. just puts them off. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, I'd like to just make a comment on a couple of things. Um, one of the experiences I've had is that uh, some of the employers, including my own local authority, don't understand how apprenticeships work to the extent that, I'll give you an example, taking on level two apprentices is great and they can do customer services and business admin, which is both sort of applicable to everything they're doing and um, is easy to find somebody to actually deliver it. Um, we've had apprentices who have been told when they've started at level two that the idea is we're gonna progress them right through to the higher levels. The problem is that the people who are running the apprenticeships don't understand that if you've done a level one, two and a level three in customer services, you can't go on to do a level four in uh, digital marketing, which is one example, because suddenly they're told you can't go straight into that if you've done a customer service previous. So I think sometimes people have aspirations and they're good aspirations, but they don't understand the overall how the system works. The other issue we've had is having specialist areas that people want to do a qualification in that exists, but then trying to find a local provider that can offer that. Um, and often we've found lots of colleges and private providers are saying that they offer a level four in something and when you contact them they don't actually do it yet and they say oh no uh, that's to come or we go to a local provider and then we discover that they've subcontracted it to somebody in the north of kind of England and the whole communications starts to break break down yeah. so I think those are some of the issues we have found there the other thing I just wanted to comment on is the kind of levy um, talk the people at Essex and, uh, and I think it's great that we're looking at coordinating how we get more. I was quite shocked to find how much of the levy uh, is taken back by the uh, government. Um, I would hope that maybe that 25% that can be shared would be higher uh, and that they might be able to share more of it um, but I would be interested to see how that goes ahead with the sharing of the uh, levy. Uh, we don't have any big employers near us so we don't have a lot of people who have the levy we'd love to be able to share it with the smaller employees yeah no really really good points i mean i guess the thing to say is any underspend on levy at least goes back into the nationalist system and comes back through to fund the 95 percent but yeah you're absolutely right that kind of matching up of of levy sharers with um with those who could benefit from having having that contribution um you know takes a bit of coordinating on a local basis i i would hope in time we might see some more kind of um simple ways to make that happen it's still a bit clunky at the moment and it still relies on local resource and kind of relationships to to make it happen um, which, which again is, you know, not everybody is, is set up to do. Just to pick up a couple of those points there. I mean, I think, I think the, um, uh, the design of apprenticeships is actually not to say we'll take somebody at level two and we'll take them all the way through the levels and there's an, there, they'll always be on an apprenticeship. That's not, that's not what apprenticeships are about. Apprenticeships are about, do you have somebody who has the who has the potential to do a job role and is there an apprenticeship to support their training within that job role so the job role comes first not the apprenticeship 
And I kind of think that's my line with employers is this is about where are your jobs? Where are the gaps? Could that be an apprenticeship position? And could we train them? But there has to be a job role vacancy in digital marketing in order to create an apprenticeship in, in uh, or an apprentice in digital marketing. And I think that you're right that there sometimes is a, a view of, well, you've done a level two and so then you do a level three and you move on. You might only ever do one apprenticeship and that might be the right thing because you stay in that job and you don't have an ambition to, to kind of progress and make a change and that's okay. So, and so I think, you know, that that's probably worth mentioning. And the other point around providers, I, I completely agree with you around the provider base. And I think it's something that, that will, I think it will continue to develop in terms of availability. I think one of the challenges are that we've got 568 apprenticeship standards now, and lots of them are really specialist. So over time, I think we will see less of, and we've definitely seen this with reform, we will see less of, for example, colleges saying, I can do 40 different apprenticeships and be really good at all of them. I think we're seeing a much more let's play to strengths and let's really do well what we can do well and not do the other thing. So we've seen real movement within the market, both in terms of shrinking of the number of apprenticeship kind of uh, standards that, that providers train in and, and some growth as well. But we're seeing more specialism. I think one of the benefits that the coronavirus will give us is it has seen all providers have to really look carefully about their kind of digital, their blended learning, their ability to, to kind of, you know, teach in a different way and tutor and, and mentor in a different way. And I think we've seen some real improvements there and we've seen a real kind of opening up. And actually, employers and apprentices are appear to be, and it's early, but appear to be much more open to the idea of blended learning for an apprenticeship than they had been previously. So I do think the fact that, you know, if the Northeast provider happens to be the best one at delivering digital marketing, then actually, you know, that, that could be okay. Um, as an employer, you absolutely need to have sight of that. I, I, I completely get that. But actually, I think we, we will see more specialist providers doing a really good job around a selected number of standards rather than trying to be all things to all men, if you like. And that should help to improve some of the quality as well. This might seem like a really silly question. Um, it, obviously, looking at what they can spend the levy or the non-levy people can use that money for. When it comes to paying the training provider, you're saying that they would only have to pay 5%. Yeah. So how does it work? Do they have to pay the training provider and then claim the 95% the back? Or, or, yes. or does the money come direct? Because obviously money is a big issue at the moment in terms of how people... Um, they're yeah. working capital, et cetera. So it'd be good to understand yeah. how the process works. Yeah. So for, for an employer, so a non-levy employer who was going to pay the 5%, so say they had £500 to pay for their programme, um, they would pay their 5% directly to the training provider and the training provider would invoice them and agree how that payment would be taken. So they might agree to pay it up front um for you know a two-year pro if it were a one-year program if it were a two or a three-year program we're commonly seeing kind of invoices perhaps on a six-month basis or on an annual basis so they would agree how that payment would be taken from the employer and then the 95 percent that government pays goes straight from government on on the employer's behalf straight to the training provider so it's kind of paid behind the scenes and the employer doesn't have to get involved in it so a simple invoice system is is how that bit works, which is which is helpful. Karen, one question is like you know sometimes uh, we come across uh, training providers like uh, Colchester Institute, ProCat, and you know those sort of training providers. They sometimes tell us 
uh, you know, help us identify the employer. We will talk to them and kind of look after the whole process of payment, everything. So is that still the case or is it, or could we, in order to convince employers to kind of uh, work with those training providers to be kind of uh, signpost them towards those training providers and they kind of look after or take over the rest or is there, is there uh, what would you kind of recommend in terms of so that nothing's kind of lost in translation sort of yeah thing? no that's a really good point in in the majority of cases um, finding the right training provider to work with is the key element because the training provider should pretty much take all the stress out of it for an employer. They should make it happen end to end. So actually a good training provider will help with recruitment process, will oversee kind of anything that needs to be signed. If an employer doesn't have a job description, um, they haven't done those. Those are the kind of things that training providers will absolutely help with because it's in both their interests to, yeah. you know, to get that, get that employer in a good place where they want to take on an apprentice and, and where they want to look after them. So absolutely. I, I think, I think finding a training provider that you can work with very, very early in the process, you don't have to commit to a training provider until later, but for, a provi for an employer that hasn't done this before, I think finding, an finding a provider as one of the first things they do is probably the best bit of advice because actually they will then take them by the hand through everything that needs to happen. And also, you know, after our, uh, you know, session today, could you kind of circulate uh, the good training providers in this part of the world? It'll be quite helpful for um, us, everybody, because there could be, let's say, a institute somewhere. They could kind of, we, know, we as third person, we really don't know what they are really good at. They might claim that they are good at digital skills because that's the hot topic. Probably that there could be somebody, uh, another training provider in our region who would actually be good at that sort of uh, yeah. area. So it'll be helpful for the for all attendees to kind of uh, get a list of uh, uh, good yeah. training. I, I won't I won't share a list with you because there isn't such a thing. But what I will share with you is the link to find a training provider, which allows an employer to and you to search by the apprenticeship standard for anybody who delivers that apprenticeship in your area. And then on that system, it has got some independent statistics about employer satisfaction, about oh. learner satisfaction, um, and how that delivers. So that's the best thing we've got at the moment in terms of comparison. But that's great because that means that it will pick up anybody who could deliver in your area. And then, and then it's got their contact details and everything else. So yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay, right, I'm going to keep us moving because I do want to get to, uh, to the incentives and things, but um, really helpful to have some of that discussion along the way. Right, so what did the Chancellor say? So, um, on this crazy looking slide um, are the, uh, within the plan for jobs, um, these were the elements that were in the supporting jobs kind of aspect if you like the items in orange are dwp initiatives so lots of stuff around um kind of uh, getting people out of benefits into work you know we've heard some pretty scary statistics around potential um for uh in, impact of redundancy and and those things with uh recession um, so the orange things are DWP initiatives, but I am going to talk to you a bit about Kickstart. Um, the blue ones are um, uh, the ones particularly around apprenticeships and traineeships, um, where there are initiatives that I think are employer friendly now. So they're ones that you do need to know about and be able to describe. And then the green ones, I guess, are ones that sit more with the education system, but lots and lots of information in there around um, careers advice and building on that which I think is is really helpful um, and also uh, another opportunity around a, an extra year at college for those people who can't find an apprenticeship but the blue ones are the ones particularly we're going to focus on and I'll touch on kickstart as well 
So these are the headlines and I apologize for the amount of information, but I wanted you to have something that you can go back to as a reference, um, which hopefully describes it. Any employer, any employer, so this is non-levy, levy, any size, um, from the 1st of August um, to, that it's actually the 31st of January. Um, I'll add that onto the slide before I send them over. Um, anybody taking on a new apprentice, so this is a new recruit to the business, it cannot be an existing member of staff starting an apprenticeship, it is a new employee. Um, will receive an incentive for doing that. If the person that they take on is 16 to 24, they'll get 2,000 pounds. If they're over 25, they'll get 1,500 pounds. This is the first time, I mean, I've been around apprenticeship for 25 years. This is the first time um, in my work lifetime, if you like, that I've ever seen incentives on this scale. Um, you know, they're not huge, but I think they could be a nudge. Um, you know, I've seen incentives going to any size of employer, any sector, um, and for all ages. So actually really positive. There is no limit on the number. So if an employer, you know, one of our larger employers, I'm working with an employer at the moment who um, is uh, in the process of taking on 16 apprentices that will be kind of college lever type age for the first time, they will be receiving £32,000 for doing that. They would have done it anyway, um, but they're now going to get an incentive. So, you know, it's it's positive in terms of what, what's coming through. Um, those claims will be made via that apprenticeship service, via that digital account. So there'll be a button to click for employers to say, I fit into this category and a training provider will help an employer with that. And the payments will come in two equal instalments. Um, one when the learner or the apprentice has been in, in, on their program um, after three months and one after 12 months. Okay, so, so it's just split there. Um, and those payments are in addition. So within the way that funding works at the moment, there is already a thousand pounds incentive if, an, if any employer takes on a 16 to 18 year old, which basically is trying to recognise that often younger people will need a bit more support in the early stages. They're gonna, they, they, they might need a, a bit of extra mentoring. Actually, the recruitment of them might not be quite as straightforward as, you know, somebody else. Um, so um, that, that is an additional incentive to that. Um, and I've got a table at the end to hopefully um, make it easier. Um, so this is non-levy employers. The, the key thing on here really is that non-levy employers can also set up a digital account. They haven't had to up until now because lots of our colleges and providers have been able to fund their apprenticeships through um, an allocation. But for this process, they will have to set up um, a digital account. Um, and smaller employers or non-levy employers do have a cap at the moment on the amount of reservations that they can make. So that's the, um, the amount of 95% contributions, if you like, they, they can secure. So from July, that's moved up from three to 10. So a, a non-levy paying employer can have up to 10 apprentices funded by government. So that 95% contribution, um, you know, it, it, in, in, terms of, in terms of that system, a really simple system in terms of um, reserving their apprenticeship. So if they're looking at recruitment, they would reserve the funds, the training provider will help them to do that. And then they know that those funds are ready, they can recruit with confidence um, and, um, you know, and take that forward. If, if, they're, if they receive some levy transfer, that doesn't count in the 10. So they could have more apprentices than that if, if somebody else fully funds the apprenticeship. With traineeships, so traineeships are, uh, probably the better way to describe them is, is um, they're targeting uh, uh, young people and, and traineeships are designed as a shorter programme for somebody who needs some 
work experience and some skills development to be ready to take on an apprenticeship. So not all young people, perhaps one of you described just now, some employers kind of struggle a little bit because perhaps some of the young people they've been trying to employ haven't really been ready for work. Maybe they haven't got some work experience. They haven't got some of that work ethic, that ability to, to take a role in a team, to turn up on time for shift, those kind of things. If we've got young people like that, a traineeship might be the right entry route for them. So um, for the first time, we're seeing an incentive to an employer if they take on a trainee. So again, we're seeing government finally go, oh, okay. So all of these things that we expect of employers, they should take young people, they should train young people, they should do it for the good of the soul. Actually, there's a recognition as, as employer voice has pushed back to say, this is not without its cost to us. You know, yes, we can agree that this is a good idea to do, but actually from a business perspective, there absolutely is investment there. And actually I might choose to make that investment somewhere else in my business right now. So there is, I guess with the incentives, we're seeing a recognition um, that, that, you know, that there is a cost on business. So a thousand pound per trainee, um, and that is limited to 10 trainees per employer over a 12 month period. Um, and this is gonna be for employers who haven't taken traineeships before or who perhaps are expanding. We're waiting for the definition of expanding. Um, but um, yeah, that will come soon. But we're, we're expecting growth in this space and we're expecting new providers in this space. There aren't enough providers um, at the moment who are delivering traineeships and there definitely aren't enough who've been doing it well. So we're expecting to see more growth of this over the coming months, probably a little bit longer than, than perhaps some of the apprenticeships. A lot of that is, is there and up and running and working really well. Kickstart, lots of interest from employers about Kickstart. And this is the area where we've got the most limited information. We've really only got at the moment what was in, in the plan for jobs um, outline because DWP are working it up. Um, but we're expecting to hopefully get some more clarity, kind of, they've said August. Um, I, I, I know there are still quite a lot of discussions going on around this. But government basically um, announced uh, 2 billion um, uh, around Kickstart. So this is about creating new jobs, six month placements um, for young people who are on universal credit or deemed to be at risk of long term employment. So again, 16 to 24 year olds, so our younger, you know, government clearly um, are aware that, you know, the impact of unemployment is going to hit the, our younger generation. And, you know, we know if we don't do some things to kind of move that, we're kind of stacking up real problems for, for the future. Um, so the commitment here, which has got a lot of employers' interest, is that DWP will be paying 100% of the wage. Um, so national, the relevant national minimum wage for the age group for 25 hours a week, plus the associated NI costs, etc. So you can see on there that that kind of shows what the grant will be um, for a 24-year-old. Um, no cap on placements. We understand that employers will need to apply to be a part of the scheme, um, but you can't be a kickstart person and also an apprentice. Um, so you can't marry those things together. They're, they're kind of, um, they're separate kind of initiatives, if you like. And what I would say is that um, if employers that you're talking to are saying, oh, what do I know about Kickstart? I can get the wages paid. Kind of this sounds interesting. Um, I think this will be a great initiative for some employers, but they need to be aware that a 16 to 24 year old who is furthest away from the workplace, who's been on universal credit, who may never have had a job, is going to need a decent amount of support compassion um, they might have some additional needs in terms of mental health they are not going to be 
um, and I don't want to be too blunt about this, but they're not going to be the people that you can put straight into a job and let them get on with it. You know, and I think employers are kind of hopeful. They see the thing around having the salary paid and kind of think, oh, that sounds great. I'll have 20 of them, please. Um, you know, these young people are going to need some looking after. So, you know, the gift comes with some strings, if you like, in terms of that. So what does this mean for your employer conversations? Um, I've popped down here, uh, this is my scope. And when I talk to employers about skills initiatives and, and apprenticeships and all of those things, um, and I'm sure many of you would, would talk about these things in the way you do for anything you do in, in terms of, you know, when you're navigating through some of those business challenges with the people you're talking to. Make your decisions about skills be business driven, not incentive driven. So let the business need drive kind of what you can then get, because when it happens the other way around, it doesn't work. Um, so I've put some questions on there. I'm not going to teach grandmother to suck eggs. They will be absolutely the sorts of things I know you guys um, will be talking to your employers about, you know, where are your gaps? What's your plan? When do you need it? How are you going to how are you going to manage it when it happens? What have you already got and what can you build on? All of those things apply around skills as well. So I've popped that slide in. Um, but I don't think I need to talk about it any more than that particularly. The next couple of slides are tables and the more that I've, I've kind of tried to put the initiatives in a really simple kind of format so that you can refer to them. So I hope that helps. So if, if you've got an employer that's interested in work experience options, so they're not ready to employ, but actually they do recognize that they need to get some young people starting to understand more about their industry. They might be on a growth trajectory for the next two or three years. How could they start to kind of get some of those people having sight of their business? How could they start to kind of think about their talent pipeline and who might be recruits in the future? So I've put the work experience options on there, um, both in terms of industry placements, which they can get, um, linked to T levels, kind of how many hours, and those have incentives as well if it's linked to a T level and what the progression on looks like, and also traineeships, which we've just described a little bit. So a traineeship, for example, the minimum requirement around work experience is 70 hours. Usually a training provider will be finding the trainees, but it could be an employer that finds them. Um, and, and usually the, the training provider will try and match a trainee to a kind of job or a kind of sector that they're interested in. So, um, you know, th this is about, again, kind of working with the, the, a good provider who's going to support um, em employers around this. Um, there isn't a payment on these. You could choose to support expenses or meals or those kind of things if you felt that were going to help and actually your incentives or the employer incentives could be used to help that so we know that in some parts of our region particularly we have some issues with transport and rurality and getting young people to those places of work um, you know actually could that incentive be used to pay travel expenses for example you know that might just be a way of getting young people kind of to, to see and experience those businesses the next one um, is just those apprenticeships incentives that we've already talked about um, the green line is which employers so you can see less than 50 employees 50 plus employees and levy payers so what is the funding arrangement for them the blue line is um, actually one of the things that most employers don't really understand is that they won't have to pay or they're unlikely to have to pay national insurance contributions for an apprentice particularly um, national insurance contributions are not payable for any apprentice under 25 unless they are on the upper earnings limit which is I think it's something like £857 a week. We're not, we've not got many apprentices on those kind of salaries. We do have some, but we haven't got many. Um, so, um, you know, that's another decent saving for most employers. Um, so you can see in the black there, the kind of total of what might be available. 
um, with, with those incentives. So different types of employers and the different age groups down the sign. So you could just do a quick ready reckoner um, that might help you or I hope it will. Um, potential benefits. So, you know, industry placements, traineeship, kickstart, I've put in brackets because we don't know as much about it at the moment, but and apprenticeships. So you can see there my thoughts around potential benefits, but it's by no means exhaustive. And, you know, like you, when you're working with employers, the things that hook them in will be different for different employers, won't they? So some want to, you know, I meet employers who say, I'd love to take on an apprentice because someone gave me a go when I was a lad. <laughs> and actually, I'd like to give back. So it's not about the incentives and it's not about the paperwork and everything else. For others, their drivers will be very different things. So, you know, all of those things, I guess, on, on this slide really are around, you know, I can't imagine there'd be many employers that would look at that list and think there isn't something in there for them, you know, in terms of something to consider about why they might, they might talk themselves out of it again. Um, but actually in, in terms of perhaps why they might, and, and that bottom kind of um, bullet there is, is just me saying, I guess, incentives could be the help needed or the nudge to get something established. So, you know, if, if an employer took on two younger apprentices and potentially could get £6,000 for that, they could use that to contribute to the salary. They could take, they could, for example, um, you know, somebody that works in their business, it could give them another five hours a week. You know, if they had a part time worker in their business, they could say, if we gave you another five hours a week, would you look after the apprentices? You know, could you kind of be the, be the kind of constant and, and the mentor to them or, or whatever? You know, there are various ways that it could happen, um, you know, and not all apprentices are young and not all of them will need a huge amount of support. But I think employers do need to go into this thinking, whilst I'm paying them perhaps a slightly lower salary at the beginning, I can get some incentives. Actually, the requirement on me to train them up, to get them established in my team, to support them and get them working as well as I can will be worth its investment because actually kind of within time um, and lots of our employers say it only takes about three months to really get apprentices in the swing of it. Now, that's going to depend on the business and the and the industry without a doubt. Um, but, you know, em employers say positive things about how short that kind of intensive kind of support phase is, um, you know, and you have to do that with all new staff, let's face it. Um, some further considerations there. Um, often this is about time. It's time to consider it. It's time to find a training provider or build that relationship. It's time to plan it in. Um, you know staff time to kind of supervise and mentor so often you know those are those are absolutely cost to the businesses to the business but not necessarily tangible costs in terms of put your hand in your pocket and this is going to cost you 500 quid actually you know it, it is more of that kind of um people investment or time investment which i know some employers haven't got um, and to be fair, if employers are too busy to kind of think about some of that stuff and recruit staff well, they're probably too busy to have an apprentice, if I'm honest. So, and that's okay. You know, we want, we want employers who want apprenticeships and want to do a good job with it. Um, so, you know, not seeing it as a source of cheap labor where I don't have to put much in. This really is about thinking about gaps and development in your workforce and future proofing and, and all of those good things. Um, cost of resources is sometimes um, something that employers say to us around, um, you know, well, they would need tools or equipment or I'd need a laptop for my apprentice. So, you know, if they're going to have an apprentice and it's somebody where the employer at the moment um, is partially working from home or 100% working from home at the moment, an apprentice is probably going to need some kit in order to work on. So again, incentives might be something that could pay for that right now. 
um, and it can go towards salary or, or expenses, as we say, as I said. I've put you some useful links in there. I will put a couple more. Um, what I've put at the top is actually your own Growth Hub site. Um, each of your Growth Hub sites has an area on apprenticeships and T levels. It's really good. It's got all the right links in it. Um, so it's already there for you. The information is current. Minimum wage for apprenticeships on there is current. And on each of those, um, on each of those um, pages on your own hub sites, um, there's a toolkit which, is, um, which was designed last year. And I know because I had some involvement in those um, with the LEPs. It's a really, really good resource written for employers that are new to apprentices. So there's chapters on each stage, but it's practical stuff. It's, it's a tool or a template or what to ask your provider. It's questions for apprentice interviews. It's kind of all there. So if you haven't had a look at the toolkit, just to see, you don't need to know the ins and outs of it, but actually if you've got an overview of it, then you can confidently say, I know there's something in the toolkit for that. Here's the link, have a look kind of come back to me or go to your training provider then with, um, with your question. Um, and I've put on the bottom of there our ambassador portal. So it, it's quite new, but it's growing. Um, that is the kind of place where we share kind of updates or we share um, case studies around employers and what they're doing. We're currently developing um, some uh, case studies um, across the southeast region some apprenticeship case studies so we're hoping to have the first ones ready for October um, and we're working with Louise Aitken on that um, and um, you know we want to give you more tools in your armory to say here are some case studies here's why employers do it but those kind of things so again that sharing the employer voice we know um, is really important and breaking some of that perception you know so i did apprenticeships 10 years ago i had a horrible experience well here are three case studies from employers around your area that you will know about why they think it works for them you know so there's something there um you know to to share and that you'll be very pleased to know i'm sure um is the content in terms of I, I'm really sorry. I know that was a lot to take in. and It was a bit of a romp through in places, but I kind of wanted to make sure with the time we had, you kind of had as many facts and figures as you can in terms of the case, the financial case. What do we currently know, um, you know, that, that might that might help. But we certainly have got a few more minutes, sort of five minutes or so. Um, I'm happy to do a little bit longer if anybody does want to stay on. But I know you've all got um, other day jobs to get to. Um, but um, are there any other burning questions or things in the chat, Ivana, that you think are worth picking up now? Uh, no, there are no questions in the chat at the moment. So kind of open to the floor. So who would like to start with any additional questions? Yeah, hi. I've got a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, Damien. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, the, the digital account, um, are the funds in there effectively virtual funds? Yes. And there's no way at all of, of, of drawing that funding down. It can't be taken out of the account. Okay, that's great. Exactly um, right. It's 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 a virtual account. Government have it locked down, um, so okay. it can only be used on apprenticeship training and and can't be used for other things. Whether in time we will see a, a wider opening up of that levy and what it can be used for, we'll see. But at the moment, yeah, that's the case. Okay. Um, second question yeah. um, is in regard to um, the training provider. If the apprentice starts the uh, apprenticeship and for one reason or other decides that it's, it's not for them, yep. um, how liable is the employer to, um, to continue uh, making payments for the, to the training provider? So if the agreement has been made, where, where does it sit with the, the employer? Yeah, so what happens is if, a, if an apprenticeship stops, so say yeah. somebody's taken on a two-year apprenticeship at month five, they, they move abroad, um, the apprenticeship yeah. stops or they leave employment, then the funding stops. So government stop paying the provider funding 
Um, okay. So, so that stops. Um, what would need to be looked at and what most training providers would do would be if the employer has paid their 5% upfront, they might reimburse some of that money. But again, that would be the contract between the employer and the provider as to kind of how much of that, you know, gets paid back. But that should be in the, in the original contract that is agreed. But yeah. Okay. And two very quick questions to, to add to my final point. Um, what is a traineeship? Um, what, what is the end result? Is it a, a traineeship certificate or is it a, uh, is there anything else that goes with that? Is it, is it how recognized, I guess, is, is Yeah, so it doesn't have to have a formal qualification in it, but some of them will. Okay. So if it's appropriate for the individual, um, so for example, if somebody, if a training provider had a trainee that was really keen to work in the care sector, then it is mm. quite possible that the provider would do the care certificate with the trainee during their traineeship because that would be almost the single component that would really help them to then secure a job or an apprenticeship in that sector. So if there's something really, really relevant to that sector mm. that will open the door in terms of mm. getting an interview or whatever else, mm. then often you'll see that delivered. Um, they might deliver some English and maths. They might get their functional skills while on that traineeship. But more often, it's, it's less about formal qualifications and more mm. about that work experience, that ethic, stabilizing their, perhaps their mental health and their confidence. It's often about the personal skills and communication than it is about anything else. So I like traineeships for that very reason, because it's what are the things that I need in order to be able to handle an interview, to get a job, to get an apprenticeship, to move on to my next step and not just doing a qualification and ticking a box for the sake of it. So it, it is more about that. Okay. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, Karen, you mentioned about the levy transfer mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the crucial bit is the coordination element in a level. You mentioned that ECC are looking into it. Do you have any idea when that's going to materialize or uh, that coordination function? No, so I'm not sure on the timeline at the moment. I don't know whether Ivana knows any anymore. I know Caroline Betts in Essex County Council is looking at it, and uh, I certainly the last I heard she gave um, an update on a call I was on about a month ago and said they were pretty close to being able to launch and they'd already secured some levy transfer and commitment from employers and would then be looking at the process so um, so yeah I haven't got a timeline on it for you but but probably behind the scenes Yvonne might be able, able to ask Louise and send that round on an email as to what the current plan is. Yes, I will. I will do that. Just to add to it, um, the latest information for Essex on that is that they are actually working on a platform. So they just, um, yeah, they, they purchase a platform and they are just doing some um, developments of how that is actually going to work. So um, I'll, I'll ask Louise and I ask um, Caroline to provide some further information for um, Essex guys. But obviously, when it comes to uh, Kent and East Sussex, I'm going to have to go back to the uh, um, respected local authorities and find out some more. Thanks. Just um, hypothetically, Karen, if, um, if a business has taken on a, uh, an apprentice and because of the current situation or any situation really, that business fails, the apprentice is, let's say, six months in, is, is there any fallback plan or compensation or whatever that can be applied to that yeah so um if if the if the business fails in terms of and, and incentives are being paid obviously that that would go no you know they, yeah. that that ends it if you like what's been paid has been paid in terms of that mm -hmm. in terms of the apprentice themselves mm -hmm. there's quite a lot of provision to try and support any apprentice that is made redundant so we have already seen um, an amount of redundancies, obviously, generally, but that applies to apprentices as well, because they are employed status, just like any other employee. Um, so 
uh, we're expecting very early in August um, the uh, National Apprenticeship Service is working really hard on a redundancy matching program nationally for apprentices. So they've already done a call out to a lot of the larger apprenticeship employers to say, if we had a redundant apprentice doing an apprenticeship that you deliver in your locality, would you be prepared to interview them and see whether or not you could support their remaining apprenticeship? So there'll be a kind of matching service behind the scenes. Training providers are already used to helping apprentices find another job. So um, that would happen as well. And there are some rules around how long they can stay on program without an employer and those kind of things. So there's quite a lot of provision if they are if they are kind of and, and if a business failed, it would kind of be taken in that same way, if you know what I mean. OK, thanks. Jackie, you asked me at the beginning around virtual working and I mean we have seen a number of employers um, recruit new apprentices um, I've got a small IT business um, in my ambassador network in Hertfordshire who um, has recruited an apprentice during lockdown who's never been in the office um, you know and, and actually they've made that work now they're an IT business and so they're pretty confident in terms of working virtually and those kind of things but actually there are a number of examples some of our local authority members are looking at the moment about they've been they've been doing virtual recruitment and kind of breaking out of their comfort zone a little bit and actually are looking at taking those apprentices on I think it's going to depend on what the job is who that individual is and, and those kind of things around whether or not you can make that work. I certainly don't think it's easy or ideal for a lot of 16 to 18 year olds to be taking their first job and be left to it at home. I think that's, that's tricky. Um, and I'm saying that quite generally, and there could be some that could absolutely do it. We know that with quite a lot of employers, they've delayed a little bit, perhaps some of their plans for recruitment. Um, but we equally have a lot of apprentices across the country. If you think how many apprentices have been um, brought into public sector type apprenticeship roles, we already have a lot that work kind of um, from home as well as in, a, in an office space. So it's not a no-no as in starting an apprentice under these conditions, but I do think it needs some careful consideration. Are there any additional guidelines around that or is it just within the employer's normal um, working model? Yeah, exa exactly yeah. that. And nearly everything. I mean, one of the simplest things I think with an apprentice is um, nearly everything is exactly the same as all your other employees. They are employed status with employed terms and conditions, same holidays, same working kind of, you know, patterns access those kind of things so you know if you're in a high risk industry there might be a few additional things if you take on a 16 or 17 year old that you might want to think about in terms of health and safety risk assessment or equipment that they may not be able to use but for the majority the kind of terms and conditions and the ways of working would be exactly the same as any other you know which also means you know an apprentice can and should be disciplined, can be dismissed if they're not doing their job. You know, you go through all the same kind of processes as you would do with anyone else. They might need a bit of additional support at the beginning and a bit of understanding, you know, to help them get in the swing of it. But they are an employee at the end of the day and should be treated as such. This is a job <coughs> with training, not a training position, if you like. Okay. Thank you. Karen, um, I, don't, I don't know whether you're happy to stay for another couple of three minutes if anyone anyone has got any further questions. No, just a little yeah, quick sure. one. Um, just about the um, plan for new jobs and the bonus. Um, is, do they have to, does the employer have to um, provide a minimum amount of hours or do, is there some sort of way that it could be abused by them or just putting them onto zero hours contracts and then firing them after three months and getting the bonus for that? Yeah, so I mean, it, it is it is possible. For, look, I mean, the um, the bonus for an apprentice, they can now be on a zero hours contract. So we know that in some sectors, that was always a no no for apprenticeships. Yeah. Um, but actually, apprentices can be part time. 
Um, it might mean their training program or their apprenticeship program needs to be extended in order yeah. to, you know, to see that through. They can be on a zero hours contract as long as they are over a year, if you like, doing enough hours um, uh, okay. to, to be able to do that. So all of those things are possible. Um, if we had an employer claiming the inside, do you know what? In all honesty, I'm not sure it's going to be worth it to go <laughs> through the process of setting up yeah. the training provider and getting set up. For, to get 50% of a, you know, of a £2,000 bonus at month three yeah. for a £1,000. I almost think, yeah. I mean, it's... Well, yeah, you might yeah. be surprised. Be true, <laughs> true. Okay, true. okay. Fair enough. Um, I'll, I'll I was just thinking you could maybe train someone to have the benefit of having an apprentice and then put them on a zero hours contract and give them no hours and then just fire them after three months and say you've employed them and yeah. Get them a free money. Yeah, the training provider has yeah. to, has to have a check that they are doing an adequate amount of hours every okay. month through their yeah. programs. So, oh, okay. so there are there are quite a lot of checks and balances in there to protect that for an apprentice, anyway. Okay, brilliant, cool. Cheers. I mean, if if any of you kind of following this, obviously, I'll, I'll share the slides. Um, but if, if anybody kind of does, um, you know, have any other, you know, I don't know, those things where this afternoon you're doing something else, you think, I still don't get that bit, or I've now got another question because I've reflected a little bit. I'm very happy to kind of pick those up. If you want to perhaps fire them through, um, through Ivana, and we'll just kind of collect them and I'll, I'll respond to them. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. If you want to hook up with me, I'm quite happy to pick up queries or bits and pieces through something like that. Um, I actually don't have an issue if you want to share my email address, Yvonne, if you want to, oh, you, um, that's fine. Um, you know, so, so if you think there are some particular things that I can help or point you, if I don't know the answer, I usually know where to find it or who to ask. So that can be useful because it is complex. And I think, you know, you guys are busy people. You start out on a journey to answer a question on gov.uk and end up, end up with five more questions than you started with and not the answer to the one that you wanted. I know how that feels. So um, yeah, if, if there are some things over the, over the coming kind of couple of weeks as, as some of this beds in that, that you think I can easily answer, then I, then I will do. Okay, thank you, Karen. So if there are not, no, no further questions, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. uh, I think what we're going to do, we, we obviously will share the recording. I do apologize, there will be a little bit of a break where the Alex's um, internet um, sort of dropped off, but um, you will have then the opportunity to share the recording with your, um, with your work colleagues as well, because I know that um, some of you guys um, will, some of your team members are actually on holiday at the moment. So that would be one thing. I'll also do a follow up with the presentation and with links um, to, to the toolkit. And um, I know that you're probably very familiar with, with, with your own website, but if you're not, but we've got a few colleagues from um, other business support um, agencies. So obviously, um, then they can have a look at that information as well. So Karen, thank you. Pleasure. Alex, you, you, can, you can stop recording now. I 